Good evening, everybody. I am uh, Laura Dubé. I'm uh, the James McGill Chair of Consumer and Lifestyle Psychology and Marketing at the Des Hotel Faculty of Management. I'm sure many of you are asking now, what is she doing in medicine? Uh, we, uh, I'm also the founding chair and scientific director of the McGill Center for the Convergence of Health and Economics uh, with three co-academic directors. One of is here, Alain Daguerre for medicine, uh, with a co-director also for management and another one for agriculture. And we were created as a McGill Center just three years ago, but it is more than 15 years about kind of uh, moving, uh, trying to bring together like-minded scientists in various disciplines with others from the complexity science to see can we do um, um, a better job we have been doing as scientists uh, so far in bringing together the various uh, knowledge that we have, the various metrics, the various models, to address better uh, some of the major challenge since uh, still facing 21st century society in spite of the tremendous progress we have been making for the last 300 years or not. And one of the key challenge is giving to our child uh, a life course of uh, physical and mental health and well-being. Um, you may be su surprised to know, or you may know already, that for the second year in a row in the USA, uh, the life uh, expectancy has been diminishing for the second year in a row. So as a society, as scientists, uh, I think that there is a sense of urgency uh, in, in getting serious in doing science differently. And uh, tonight, I'm very, very pleased to welcome Jay Belsky, uh, who uh, has been and is a pioneer and leading scientist uh, in terms of how can we better understand the biology, the brain, the environment, so that we can set our children uh, on a life course of physical and mental health and well-being. Uh, so I uh, want to long at all in the introduction. I will very briefly introduce Jay. Uh, Jay is the Robert M. and Natalie Reed uh, Dorn Professor of Human Development at the University of California, Davis. Uh, his work, as I said, uh, is in the field of child development and family studies. Uh, the area of special expertise include daycare, parent-child, and other developmental experience. Um, and uh, not only applying this for children, but also a very, we spend a full day uh, in a more uh, in-depth uh, workshop. And his knowledge uh, has been enlightening our discussion and thinking for the whole day uh, within all type of context, not just into uh, child uh, development. Uh, Jay is also, he has many, many awards that I won't list, uh, but one that I think is important, uh, in 2005, he received the Balby Answorth Award for Contribution to Attachment Research, a Theory and Research. And in the same year, he was listers, listed among the top greatest living behavioral and brand science, living legends almost, um, based on citation analysis. In 2016 and 2017, he was um, um, uh, recognized by the Web of Science as being among the top work, one person of scholars cited in the field of psychiatry and psychology. His talk tonight, Beyond Risk, Resilience, and Dysregulation, uh, Differential Susceptibility, and For Better and For Worse, uh, in Environmental Influences, uh, will be essentially um, a review of the concept of the empirical evidence and so on, um, and providing hope <laughs> that there is an environment out there that is all, not all bad <laughs> and that we can act uh, in, a, in a positive manner. Jay, welcome. Thank you very much. As I said this morning, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I look forward to sharing the ideas and um, let's, in, unless there's something that's not clear, which there may well be, 
Um, let's leave questions till the end, if you don't mind. If, um, but if there is something that's unclear, I've mumbled my words, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask me to repeat it. In fact, if I start talking too fast, being the New Yorker that I am, just, just slow me down, um, kind of thing. I don't know if that's genetic or cultural, but it is. OK. Um, well, it has long been argued that early and even later, and even later in life, developmental experiences and environmental exposures shape who we become. It has long been appreciated that, that there are individual differences in susceptibility to these environmental influences. The classic way of thinking about such variation in environmental sensitivity is often referred to as the diathesis stress model within the field of psychopathology or a dual risk model of person by environment interaction. And here we have a figure that my colleagues, Marion Bakermans Kranenberg and, and Marinis Van Eisendorn, created to express this notion. Um, and what you can see here is we have the environment broadly conceptualized as positive and supportive versus adverse and otherwise. And here we have more adva favored, advantage, positive chi child development outcomes or adult levels of functioning and more problematical. And the basic notion behind the diathesis stress model is that under positive conditions, those who carry a latent risk, temperamental, physiological, genetic, differ not at all from those who don't carry that organismic risk factor. It's only under conditions of adversity that that latent risk becomes manifest. And that's why we conceptualize those individuals as vulnerable to adversity. In contrast, and really the definition of resilience is the individuals who encounter the same adversity, poverty, a depressed mother, an alcoholic father, um, domestic violence, you name it, whatever you're interested in, who don't succumb. They're by definition resilient. And that's a framework that's guided um, research in child development and psychopathology for decades, and let me say, has done so productively. So um, I want to cast some aspersions on this conceptual framework, but I want to make it clear that it's been functional and has afforded a great deal of progress. So um, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I just want to raise two evolutionary questions that challenge the sensibility or the theoretical robustness of this model. The first is, why would nature craft a developmental system for generating disturbances in development? Um, I don't think anybody who's ever promulgated the death of stress model has ever engaged in this question. Um, and I think that reflects one of the fact that questions of ultimate causation, why things function the way they do from an evolutionary standpoint, kind of doesn't get addressed in much of the medical sciences and certainly not the psychological sciences to a large extent. We're very fascinated with effects of exposures and the instantiating mechanisms. But we don't really ask the question, why should functioning or development operate the way it does? And I think the minute you ask that why question, you end up with ch challenges to this point of view. I think even a bigger question for we developmentalists who study children is why would natural selection craft an organism whose future is influenced by its earlier experiences. Now, anybody who believes at all in nature and rearing and parenting and whatever else it is never poses this question. In fact, what I'm struck by is in my first 30 years in this business as a professional, to say nothing as, you know, all those years as a student, nobody ever posed this question. The assumption is we humans are a plastic, developmentally plastic, environmentally malleable species, unless you're a radical naturist, you know, it's all in the genes, um, and they just get expressed and that's the end of the game, that even for those of us who believe even a little bit in nurture, we've never answered this question of why should our early developmental experiences shape us? Because I think the minute you do, you confront a fundamental reality, and that is the future is, and as far as we can tell, always has been uncertain. Well, the implication of that means that if all of us were shaped by our early exposures, and those early exposures were not consistent with what we later encountered, then we would all risk being mismatched to the future. And we'd all go over the proverbial waterfall. It seems to me that nature should have hedged its bets and should have um, made it so that we all wouldn't follow a socialization lead or whatever experiential exposure lead we might otherwise be, because if that doesn't prepare us, for tomorrow, 
because tomorrow turns out different than today, then we'd be in trouble. And indeed, that leads me, and, and you know, this isn't just a theoretical idea. I don't like this example, but I use it all the time. The killing fields of Cambodia. Who did the Khmer Rouge murder first when the Americans vacated Southeast Asia? And the Khmer Rouge chased all the Cambodians out of the cities, into the countryside, into slave work camps. They killed and they murdered people like us. They wore glasses or they had uncalloused hands because they believed in marker variables. And those were markers that you're educated and we don't want you. Now just step back and think maybe about your own parents and certainly many of those Cambodian peasant parents who told their children, go to school, study hard, respect your teachers, do your homework, and you won't have to bake, break your back bending over the field in the rice paddies like I have. You can get a better job. That's what my father told his sons when he ran a restaurant and he made us work there, is that you know, one of the lessons was, you don't want to do this for the rest of your life. Well, imagine now you're one of those peasant parents who is encouraging your children to study hard so that they don't have to break their, break their backs in the fields you know, when they grow up. And I've got two kids, I'm a Cambodian parent. And I've got one kid who listens who follows my lead, who studies hard, who does homework, who doesn't, play, who doesn't engage in play hooky, who respects his teacher. And I've got another who couldn't care less, who'd rather kick the soccer ball around or rather chase the crickets and the snakes or whatever Cambodian children could do other than their homework. Well, which one ended up better off? Not the one who followed the parent's lead. That was murdered, that adult was murdered first. The point is, tomorrow is unpredictable. Um, what works today doesn't necessarily work tomorrow. Even if we think, oh, this is going to pay off, it may not. And so that kind of thinking led me to offer a different, I think, more evolutionary informed model of plasticity, which basically suggests that, yes, there are some individuals who are disproportionately likely to succumb when things go bad, but they're simultaneously disproportionately likely to flourish when things go well. Um, and so th they are developmentally plastic, not simply as the ethicist stress and dual risk thinking suggests for worse, but for better and for worse. There's a trade-off. The risk of, the, 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 the downside of being malleable in the face of good things is that you're malleable in the face of bad things. Um, so nature here is hedged its bet according to this model. But notice there's something else very important. And that is what happens theoretically to the resilient under conditions of high nurturance and support. They don't benefit, according to this theoretical model. We're going to test it. We're going to see. So this was basically a theoretical idea based on first principle thinking. The future is uncertain. Therefore, we all shouldn't be susceptible to early experiences or any experiences, because those may not prove to be good leads tomorrow or the next day. You know, this is really in human development terms, financial portfolio theory. You know, I used to say, what's the, first th what's the first principle of investing? Don't invest what you can't afford to lose. What's the second principle of investing? Diversify your investments. Don't put all your money in the bank. It could go under. Don't put all your money in the mattress. Your house could burn down. Don't put all the money in the stock market. That could go down. Don't put all your money in, in bonds. Interest rates could go up. So what does a wise investor do, he or she? diversifies the investment. Why? Because over the long term, that generates the best gain. Because nobody knows what tomorrow is going to bring. Somebody could be lucky and put all their money in gold, and wow, it's 1978, and it turns out that's a great move. But you know, that's just the luck of, of chance. That's not a reliable strategy. So if you come as an evolutionary thinker, well, the currency of the realm in biology and an evolution is not dollars and cents. It's dispersion of genes in future generations. So the, same ar the argument basically is by varying our offspring to be more and less susceptible, we should end up with more of our genes dispersed in future generations than just having everybody susceptible. Because they're all susceptible, but the Khmer Rouge takes over, we're all dead. Well, it's one thing to have a theoretical idea. It's another thing to have evidence that is you know, in line with it. And so my first challenge, having come up with this idea, was to begin to look, is there evidence for it? So what I want to do this evening 
is go through first the observational evidence that proves consistent with this thinking, and then actually look at exper experimental intervention evidence that seems consistent with this thinking before drawing some conclusions. So we're going to look at three domains of what I call plasticity factors or experience or exposure moderators. The first is temperament. The second is stress physiology. And the third is genes, both looking at single candidate and multiple candidate genes. And so we're going to begin with the observational data and negative emotionality in babies as a susceptibility marker. Now this was the first place I looked because there was evidence out there. And it was a big surprise. Why? Because in all my training, negative emotionality, having a difficult temperament, being e easily susceptible to distress, being hard to comfort, was a risk factor. That that exposure was always conceptualized within the diathesis stress framework as a bad thing if things went badly. But middle class, well-functioning, educated, capable, affluent, resource families could cope with it. It was only in the face of adversity that that risk factor went from being latent to manifest and predicted all sorts of adverse outcomes. Well, what we're going to see is evidence that that's only half the equation. Because here's an early study from 2011 looking at how maternal empathy affects children's aggression and disobedience, as indicated by their CBCL externalizing scores. And what do we see? That as expected, there is a relationship between empathy and externalizing. The more empathy, the less externalizing. The, more, le the less empathy, the more externalizes, but only for the kids who had difficult temperaments. For the kids who had average temperaments, maternal empathy, and I'll say this again and again and again, is water off a duck's back. In fact, if you understand this and you want to take a nap, you're not going to miss a whole lot. <laughs> Here we have the same thing with a different environmental exposure. Now we're looking at the effect of marital conflict, high versus low, predicting also behavior problems more generally. Lo and behold, and that's at two and three years of age. Here we have infant irritability. And lo and behold, for the kids who have low temperament irritability, whether or not you grow up in a high conflict or a low conflict marriage makes no difference for your behavior problems. But if your parents engage in lots of physical violence versus they engage in constructive approaches to dealing with disagreements, that makes a big difference for better and for worse. That is, under low conflict conditions, you have the least behavior problems, less than these guys. And under high conflict conditions, you have the most. We have you know, a way of thinking about this is that these negatively emotional, difficult babies, like some genes we're going to see, ge some genetic characteristics, have a huge reaction range. They can go from being complete misfits to being sort of really capable and skilled people. In fact, I can tell you, you had a webinar, um, you, you folks did a webinar um, last week with my son Daniel. And I didn't realize this until well past Daniel's, into Daniel's adulthood, but he was the most impossible baby that you can imagine. And I always said, from, I, I literally said two things from that experience. One was, I'm surprised there's not more child abuse because, because I wanted to wring this baby in this toddler's neck again and again and again because he was just that difficult. Um, the other response I had was, I'm glad we got him and nobody else did. Because while I could feel like I wanted to wring his neck, I didn't. <coughs> um, but, and so one can think of these malleable kids, for whatever reason they're malleable, is kind of like a thoroughbred <coughs> racehorse, which if well trained, can be a thoroughbred racehorse. But if poorly trained, will be an out of control stallion that you'll put down. But not every horse can become that racehorse. And not every horse can become that out of control stallion either. Here we're looking at another exposure. And, I, and I'm, I'm purposely bringing up different exposures to show that the same thing seems to be operating, at least with regard to problem behavior, is that now we're looking at the observed quality of child care. And this is a case where we observed how attentive, responsive, and stimulating kids were at multiple ages across their first four and a half years of life. And we're predicting their kindergarten age behavior problems by the, rated by their kindergarten teachers who don't know anything about their, behavior pro their, their um, early infant temperaments. The temperament here is measured at three and six months of age. And once again, we see for the kids in low net with low negativity, there's no relationship between child care quality and behavior problems, even if there's theoretical reason to believe that there should be. But for the kids who are highly negative, they have the most problems when quality is low. They have the least problems when quality is high. 
They're being affected, and this is what I say, for better and for worse. And these guys, it's water off a duck's back. They're not responsive. Here we see a different level of environmental exposure. We're moving to more the macro level, or at least the molar level, because now we're talking about the general economic hardship that a, a, a child experienced from 14 to 48 months of life, predicting executive functioning at 48 months of life. Again, this time moderated by seven months negative reactivity. For the kids who are low in reactivity, economic hardship, economic hardship makes no difference. For the kids who are high in negativity, they have the best functioning under low chronicity of economic hardship and the worst functioning down here. So we've seen maternal empathy, um, quality of childcare, economic functioning. Let's move beyond temperament to a physiological level, stress physiology. Now this is important because when I started looking for evidence or running work to, to test the hypothesis that kids are differentially susceptible for better and for worse, um, I had a theoretical idea. I had a prediction. I had no mechanism. Um, but about the same time, completely independently, Tom Boyce and Bruce Ellis were developing a set of ideas, not on an a priori theoretical basis like I did, but on a post hoc empirical basis. And their hypothesis was that physiologically reactive kids, in particular, would be highly responsive to good and bad environmental inputs. And this was based upon a finding that came out of Tom's 1995 study showing, completely to his surprise, that um, highly physiologically reactive kids had the best health when they grew up under affluent conditions, and the worst health when they grew up on, on non-affluent conditions. But for kids who weren't highly physiologically reactive, you had none of those environmental effects. So Boyce and Ellis eventually developed a notion that stress physiology is the mechanism for instantiating developmental plasticity. Now what's interesting is not only did they have a mechanism where I didn't, they were of the opinion that this differential susceptibility, this differential plasticity, was itself environmentally induced. We're not going to get into that, but I want to highlight this. They didn't deny the possibility that there were inborn genetic differences in plasticity. They were just emphasizing the environmental induction of plasticity. I, in contrast, was entertaining and emphasizing, as we'll see, the genetic basis of plasticity. I wasn't denying that they could, it could be environmentally induced. I just was not thinking about that. Um, so this is, becomes interesting in contrast to where we'll go genetically because central to Boyce and Ellis's view is that this physiological, this stress physiology that looks like it's a plasticity factor is environmentally induced. So that it's experienced in exposures that not only affect development, it affect the capacity to be affected by experience and exposures. So here we see looking at effective change in paternal depression symptoms, whoops, sorry, predicting change in internalizing from 8 to 54 months as a function of children's evening level of cortisol. And as predicted, the kids who have high levels of cortisol, when their father's depression goes up, they increase in extra internalizing problems. When their father's depression goes down, they do just the exact opposite. The kids who have low levels of evening cortisol, father's change in depression has no effect on change in the kids internalizing. Here we see um, a different measure of, here we see actually not a basal cortisol level or an evening cortisol level, rather, but we're actually looking at physiological reactivity as experimentally induced in response to stress as the moderating factor. In this case, we're once again looking at marital conflict, predicting externalizing problems. And for the kids who have high respiratory sinus arrhythmia reactivity, there's a strong relationship between marriage and psychological functioning. For the kids who have low RSA reactivity, there's yellow line, there's no relationship. In other words, again and again, if we ask the question, does this environmental exposure affect development, the answer is both yes and no. It's yes for some and no for others. Here we have a, a, an exposure called overall family aggression across waves one to three of an adolescent study predicting antisocial behavior over here and um, PTSD symptoms over here. 
what's interesting is we see that for those kids who have are responders that have high physiological reactivity to a stressor, they have the most antisocial behavior and the most PTSD symptoms when they grow up in highly aggressive families. But what happens to them when they grow up in low aggressive families? The same physiological characteristics. They have the least aggression, antisocial behavior, and they have the least PTSD symptoms. In other words, we see again, for better, under good conditions, and for worse, here and that. In other words, high physiological reactivity, like high negative emotionality, is not just a risk factor. It's what I would call these days also an opportunity factor, if you're lucky enough to grow up under benign or better yet benevolent <coughs> conditions. Okay, now I want to go beyond temperament and beyond physiology and consider genes as moderators. And it's really important to remember that so much of the work on genetics, if it wasn't, there, there are two broad branches of genetic analysis we can think of. One is genotype phenotype work. What genes are associated with what phenotypes? But we can also think about genes as moderators of environmental exposures, so a G by E interaction. And that's where I'm going here. This isn't about genotype phenotype, except indirectly. So I'll start with the serotonin transporter gene. Um, the serotonin transporter gene is inherited in short or long allele. Um, so you can end up with two long alleles if you inherit a long version of the variant from both parents, or two short alleles if you end up with inherit both short alleles from both parents, or one of each. The short allele has long been thought of as a depression gene. And in fact, in initial genotype phenotype work, the expectation, and there was some evidence, that people carrying short alleles, especially two of them, were more likely to get depressed. And here was the, a classic study that, that really broke, which changed the way we think about development, or at least gave us evidence consistent with how we wanted to think about human functioning, that the effect of stressful life events, in this case on depression, long thought to be related, varied as a function of genetic makeup. And so what do you see? That as number of stressful life events go up, so does risk of depression, especially for those who are homozygous for the short allele, intermediate for those who are heterozygous, and lo lowest for those who, are, um, who have two, two long alleles. In fact, this yellow line here, compared to this lime green line, this is a flat line. There's no relationship here. Now, I saw these data before they were published. And while my good friends Afshon Kaspi and Temi Moffat did this work testing basically a, a, a diathesis stress hypothesis that it would be under adverse conditions where those short alleles would ring true, if you would, in inducing or being associated with depression, what I saw was what was going on down here. As things got approach zero in terms of number of stressful events, those short allele carriers actually, at least according to the regression lines, had the lowest level of depression. Now, obviously, there's not a lot of spread here like there is here. But is that because we never get to positive environmental e exposures? We stop at no negative one, at zero negative ones. Well, fascinatingly, Shelley Taylor saw this work and said, let's add, not all on her own, although I was thinking that she was thinking the same way as me, what happens if you extend this line over here. That is, what happens if you measure positive life events, not just negative life events, and you end up with people who have more positive life events than negative life events, not just no negative life events? What does she get? She finds that those who are subjected to high stress and carry two short alleles, that's what we have here, two short alleles, lo and behold, they have the most depressive symptomology. But guess what? If you have that genetic foundation, two short alleles, but you're exposed to low stress, you have the lowest level of depressive symptomology. So it's exactly consistent with the notion of what would happen if you could actually had a score that ranged from high levels of neg life, high, high level, uh, many negative life events to many positive life events. Um, and I think that highlights the importance of thinking beyond a diathesis stress model beyond simply adversity and its bad effects and, concept and thinking about 
nurturance and support and enrichment and its beneficial effects. Because what we keep seeing is the very individuals, for temperamental, physiological, or genetic reasons, who are most likely to succumb to adversity are also most likely to respond positively to support and enrichment. Here we see another study looking at the short alleles, now looking at parenting stress and preschoolers sleep and internalizing problems. So here's their sleep, here's sleep, and here we have internalizing problems too. And in all cases, we see the same general pattern, except over here, but three out of four, which is the short allele carriers, the vulnerable ones, have the least sleep problems and the least internalizing problems when, they expo when they're exposed to low levels of parenting stress. So once again, thinking of short alleles as risk factors or risk genes or vulnerability genes seems to me to be misguided. Now we're moving to adolescence, and here we're looking at conduct problems predicted by exposure to racial discrimination. And lo and behold, for those who have too long alleles, there's no effect of racial discrimination or the experience of racial discrimination on conduct problems. But for those with one or two short alleles, the so-called vulnerability genes, yup, if they got a lot of facial di ra racial discrimination, they had the most conduct problems, as you would expect of a vulnerability characteristic. But lo and behold, they had the least conduct problems if they're not exposed to racial discrimination. So we see again a for better and for worse effect and a, none of, a, a, a lack of an effect. Here we're looking at a different exposure. Now we're looking at school level drinking. So we've got a bunch of different schools and kids within those schools. And some schools, more kids drink. Well, you would think that the more kids in your high school that are drinking, the more at risk you are of drinking. And lo and behold, we find that for the short allele carriers, the dotted line, the shaded lines are the confidence intervals. So here we see for those with two short alleles, if your school does a lot of drinking, you do a lot of drinking. If your school doesn't, but if your school doesn't do a lot of drinking, you don't do a lot of drinking. If you are at long allele, the amount of drinking that goes on in your school doesn't matter at all. You're immune to the would-be adverse effect of lots of drinking or the apparent beneficial effect of little drinking. So does school level drinking matter for how much your son or daughter will drink as an adolescent? Yes and no, but it depends, it looks like, on the genetic makeup of that individual. Here we're looking at negative emotional behavior in marital interaction. So I, and I particularly picked out this slide because now we're dealing with adults. So this is how much negative emotional behavior is going on in a marital interaction, predicting change in marital satisfaction over a 13-year period. For those who carry two short alleles, if you had lots of negative emotional behavior 13 years earlier when, you, when these Berkeley scientists studied marital interaction, your marital satisfaction declines, as nobody's surprised and would expect. However, if you have only one short allele or two long alleles, that same exposure makes no difference. And so who ends up looking best in terms of their marital satisfaction 13 years later? Those who carried the risk, so to speak, but weren't exposed to the risk. So it's not really, so I would argue once again, thinking of short alleles as risk factors only is a misconstrual of what's going on. And my point really is more broadly that being, for good humanistic reasons, being overconcerned with adversity and its effects on dysfunction and pathology misses the developmental dynamic because it basically only thinks about risk and not about opportunity. Okay, the third, that was, the second gene I want to do is one that we just heard a lot about this afternoon and it's well studied, is the DRD4 gene. That also has been originally conceptualized as a psychopathology gene. Not for depression, like the serotonin transporter, but for ADHD. And in fact, here's some data suggesting that in fact it operates that way. And indeed, this is a fascinating piece of work that was originally done by a woman named Rosalind Newman, who I've never met. And she had these data in her table showing that the ones exposed to prenatal smoking, thought to be a risk factor for ADHD, in fact was for those who had the seven repeat allele, and not for those who had, didn't have the seven repeat allele. And although these were all her data, they were presented 
in the journal Biological Psychology, Psychiatry in such a way that this was the focus. But if you looked at her table, you could restructure it. They had the means, and they had these two cells, and you could figure out what these values were. And that's what we did. Because we were interested in whether or not there was differential susceptibility. And lo and behold, when we replotted her own data, Rosalind Newman, we discovered that those who had no prenatal smoking and had the would-be risk factor for ADHD, namely the seven repeat, were the least likely to show to have ADHD. So again, was, was prenatal smoking a risk factor for ADHD, as long thought? Was having the seven repeat a risk factor for ADHD? Both were when they co-occurred. But when you, when you didn't have prenatal smoking, but you had that would-be genetic risk factor, you were least likely. And indeed, this difference here under the no smoking turned out to be bigger than the vulnerability effect. The beneficial effect was bigger, and she completely missed it. Now, I understood why she missed it for the same reason I found it. She went looking for one thing. I went looking for another thing. And so when we wrote this up as a letter to biological psychiatry, we invited her to co-author it with us because they didn't want to sort of cast aspersions on her. She was working from a paradigm that was well established. Our point was to show that that paradigm is missing some important factors. And here we again come to adulthood, and now we're looking at observed maternal sensitivity, which we heard somewhat about earlier in the afternoon, and the effect of perinatal risk on observed maternal sensitivity. The theory being that when your baby is challenging health-wise, has high perinatal risk, you're going to be less sensitive, especially, um, and, and in fact, that's, what, that's what's found here. So if you have that seven repeat, so here you have the would-be vulnerability gene in the face of high risk at birth, and you have low maternal sensitivity. But what happens if you have the same would-be risk gene, but your kid has no risk birth? You're the most sensitive. And for those who are for the seven repeat is absent, there's no effect of whether a preterm birth on maternal sensitivity. So in answer to the question, does risk of birth, do, do birth risks affect how mothers parent? The answer is yes and no. For some it does and for some it doesn't. Those mothers who are carrying the seven repeat, it affects them to, the, to, to a good extent if the baby's not at risk and to a bad extent if the baby is at risk. And, and it, to me this is important, like the marital conflict, because I'm often asked, is this plasticity exist after childhood? Well, this clearly suggests that it is. These are not babies who are caring for babies. These are grown women who are caring for babies. Um, and here's a piece of work that I really like, and I think it ties very much in the brain to society, because what we're looking at now is carriers and non-carriers in the seven repeat, and the extent to which they are high scores show high levels of independence in their social orientation. Low scores are high levels of interdependence. Well, in Asia, interdependence is the cultural script. In the West, independence is the cultural script. Look at this. Whoops. If you grow up in Asia and you have the seven repeat, you're the most interdependent. If you grow up in, if you're a European America and you have the same genotype, you're the least interdependent, you're the most independent. In other words, what this gene, or at least is doing, or what, it's, uh, what it seems to be doing, or what it's associated with going on, is making you a more likely recipient of your culture's enculturation. Um, and that enculturation can take a variety of forms. Um, so when it takes the form of promoting interdependence, that's who you become if you're carrying that gene. When it takes the form of promoting independence, that's who you become. For the others who don't carry that version, you're neither one or the other. You're simply less enculturated, you might say, to your particular culture. OK, the third gene I want to, a candidate gene I want to highlight is BDNF. Now, BDNF is interesting because that is a brain, that's actually one that ties into plasticity in the brain. ADHD, I'm sorry, the DRD4 and, and the serotonin transporter haven't really been conceptualized a priori as plasticity genes. In fact, all I'm doing here, quite frankly, is um, taking work that's been 
conducted by psychiatric geneticists or psychologists interested in pathology and highlighting where it doesn't fit with classical diathesis stress models. BDNF, we actually have a polymorphism that's been conceptualized as having something to do with plasticity. And it looks like it's the MET allele that makes a difference, because now we're looking at how parental depression affects negative emotionality in three-year-olds. And lo and behold, for those who just have the valve version variant, and or two valve variants, the homozygous from valve allele, parental depression, present or absent, has no effect on baby's negative emotionality or toddler's negative emotionality. But look at the strength of the effect if you're carrying one or more met alleles. You're highly negative if your father's de if your parental depression, and you're the least negatively emotional if your father, if your parent is not depressed. So once again, we see, does parental depression affect kids' negatively emo negative emotionality? The answer is yes and no. For some, it does, for better and for worse. And for others, it doesn't. You can see why I said you can go to sleep if you wanted to. Here we have a study um, of early deprivation institutionalization. These are kids who grew up in Romanian adoption, in Romanian, um, very deprived Romanian institutions um, at 12, 10 or 12 years of age. We're looking at their attention problems. Those kids who have a met allele are more strongly affected. If they were adopted at a high age, i.e., they had a bigger, longer lasting dose of institutional rearing, which we know is quite deprived and insufficient, they have the most attention problems. But if they were adopted at a low age, they have the least. And those who are carrying just val alleles, they're much less affected. Now, it's very important here for me to point something out. They're both affected here. One's affected more strongly. In fact, this is what I call a weak differential susceptibility effect. When, that, when this line is flat, I call it a strong differential effect, susceptibility effect. So we're not talking about here individuals who are, and who, are, who are and are not affected. We're talking about individuals who are affected to differential degrees, to a different degree. Here we see a study of physical activity um, on adolescent girls' depression, as moderated by BDNF. So physical activity is often thought as a treatment for depression. And lo and behold, what do we discover? It both works and it doesn't work. That is, for those met allele carriers who we've already seen susceptible to, in other pheno, to other exposures vis-a-vis -vis other phenotypes, if you're, in high, if you're a low physical activity and you're a met carrier, you have the most depressive symptoms. If you have high physical activity, you have the least. For those who are val carriers, physical activity makes no difference. So the story, once again, is exactly the same. Does physical activity seem to affect depression in adolescent girls? Yes and no. No for some, yes for others. And for those it does, it does so in a better, for better and for worse manner. And here's the last candidate gene I'll show you in this form. And now we're just looking at the effect of parent, parent rearing on a personality dimension of self-directedness. And lo and behold, look how the regression line becomes steeper as you go from no met alleles to one met allele to two met alleles. This is a dose-response relation in terms of developmental plasticity. The better rearing is, the stronger is its effect on self-directedness, for better and for worse, depending on how many met alleles you carry. So again and again, the story looks the same. It's not just that carriers of certain variants of polymorphisms are more susceptible to adversity. They are. But the very same, the very same would be risk gene is associated with better functioning under nutrient conditions, under high nutrient conditions, however you conceptualize high nutrient conditions, high physical activity, low marital conflict, greater maternal empathy, or whatever. Now, the truth is that, as somebody pointed out earlier in the day, even if, we ha even if there are genes for plasticity, and I think there should be, and I'm not saying that these are those, but they seem to operate like that, even if there are genes for plasticity, they probably all have small effects, like we keep seeing in many studies that individual genes have small effects. So what happens when you accumulate genes and make what we now call a polygenic score? Well, I think actually, we were the first to do this, certainly from a G by E perspective. And we theorized, or I theorized, that you know, if you take this idea 
to its logical extreme, you should see a dose-response relationship in the degree to which an environmental experience is affected developmental outcomes such that when there are no plasticity alleles, there's no effect. And when there are a lot, there's a stronger effect. And when there are somewhat in between, there should be a greater. So what we see here is the hypothesis of a gradient of plasticity. That's a theoretical model. It's a logical model. It builds right on the components we've already seen. But it's one thing to have a theoretical, logical model. It's another thing to ask, is there any evidence of it? Well, I got hooked up when I was living in London with a guy who I've never met to this day, um, Kevin Beaver, in Florida. And Temi Moffat told me I should talk to him. Well, I called him up on the phone, and I said, Temi Moffat said I should talk to you about doing some differential susceptibility-related G by E work. And I said, what I'm interested in doing is looking at a multiplicity, a polygenic approach. We didn't have that term at that point, but I wanted to put multiple genes together in the same way people put multiple environmental factors together. Let's put multiple genes together. And he said, well, what do you need? And I said, well, we need a good environmental exposure. He says, I got one. I've got a nice parenting measure in adolescence the degree to which they're autonomy granting versus controlling and hostile. I said, OK. I did. We need a good developmental outcome, a phenotype. He says, I got one. I said, what is it? He says, it's, it's self-regulation, or he called it self-control. And what's nice about it was that it both tapped into behavior, cognition, and emotion. OK. And then he said, what else do you need? I said, well, do you have any of these set of polymorphisms in your data set that there was already hints were acting like susceptibility genes. And he said, I've got a bunch of them. I said, let's package them and see what the relationship is in that parenting to that self-control, a parenting predictor to that self-control outcome as varying by number of would-be plasticity genes. Well, when I first saw these data, I thought, oh, that's what we expected. It wasn't until two or three days later I hit me over the head and said, those data, you know, if somebody said you fabricated those data, I might have to say, you know, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Because they came out so close to the theoretical model. So here what we're looking at is DADTAT1, DRD2, DRD4, 5-HTTLR, and MAOA. These were all identified a priori. I had a longer list, but he only had these five. And lo and behold, look what's happened. If you have 0 or 1 plasticity alleles out of these, there's no relationship. Two there's a little bit of a relationship. Three, there's a little bit more of a relationship. Four or five, there's even a stronger relationship. There's a gradient of plasticity, <coughs> such that under good parenting quality, you have the most self-control. Under bad parenting quality, you have the worst self-control as a function of your genetic makeup. And so this was, so I would say there are three different ways these days which people make polygenic scores. One is this. We just had a handful of suspects. This study, this data set opportunistically, this is the, uh, ad, the ad, ad health study, by the way, had a, a limited number of them, of which five were on my list. It wasn't biologically informed. It was informed simply by other GYE work that threw out these genes as potential plasticity factors. We saw today some work by Patricia in which, better yet, one is thinking biologically and say, we've got some biological systems here, underlying systems, which we think are important. Let's get the genes for those and see how it operates. And Patricia has done that very successfully and informatively. And the third way, of course, is the theory free way, which is just to get a bunch of genes out of GWAS that correlate with a phenotype and plug it in here. I wouldn't advise that. For, I won't go into exactly why. If you want to ask me later, um, you could. But anyway, this was, to me, this was dramatic and surprising. But I'm not the only one who subsequently discovered this. Because here we have, back to the racial discrimination study, looking at adolescents' risky cognition, the extent to which they endorse deviant behavior, belief and need to be tough, be focused on the present over future orientation, engaged in risk taking. This is, an ad this is a black adolescent population in, in Georgia, in rural Georgia. And lo and behold, when you put 5-HTTLPR and DRD4 together, each of which we've seen already, we could have 0, 1, or 2 plasticity alleles. And discrimination at times 3 is predicting this latent risky cognition factor to a degree 
that's a function of the number of plasticity alleles. The more would-be plasticity alleles you have, i.e., the more short alleles or the more seven repeat alleles you have, the stronger is the association for better and for worse. Here we see the same thing, this time looking at a measure of the affluence or lack thereof of the social environment. It's a favorable versus an adverse social environment measured across four waves of data collection predicting aggression at wave five. Again, looking at just 5-HTTLPR short alleles and DRD47 repeat, you see the same association. Not significant when you have no plasticity alleles, most significant when you have two plasticity alleles, and intermediate when you have one plasticity allele. A gradient of plasticity, again, in a for better and for worse manner. More, the more plasticity alleles you have, the more you're affected by an adverse social environment when it comes to your future aggression. The more plasticity alleles you have in a favorable environment, the less aggressive you are um, subsequently. Here we see even a stronger gradient because now what we're looking at is parenting you experience in adolescent and how hostile your romantic relationships are in young, in young adulthood with a set of one, two, three, four, five plasticity alleles. And you can see here you've got greater variation in number of plasticity alleles from zero to eight. And as the number of plasticity alleles goes up, so does the association from parental hostility to your own hostile romantic relationship. And again, in a for better and for worse manner. I mean, to me, these data are just striking. Um, and the people who went out to do this work didn't necessarily buy into the hypothesis. They were setting out to test the hypothesis. And here we see now a similar finding, family economic status, predicting young adult economic status, moderated by genetic plasticity, one, two, three, four, five different polymorphisms. And most importantly, and this is critical, this is a sibling comparison. That is to say, what we're looking at are siblings who have no two, four, six, or eight possible plasticity alleles. Now, to me, this is critically important because when I first came up with the idea of differential susceptibility, my thinking was that this is a strategy for families to vary their progeny. That is, if we're parents, we don't want all progeny, quite, or biology doesn't want, Mother Nature is wise enough to say to us, you don't want all your kids who will listen and do everything you want them to do. Because if you, because we have the Cambodia example. So what Mother Nature should be having you do is varying the degree of malleability of your kids. Some will be highly socializable in the direction you want, and some will be not. Um, and up until this work, all the work I've shown you has been between family. That is, we have kids in this family who have one or not plasticity allele, and kids in that family who have different number of plasticity alleles. Here we have kids in the same family. So in other words, they've got the same exposure to family economic status. But to the extent that family income predicts their own income as adults differs by the number of plasticity alleles in the family. So you want to know why two or three or four kids in a family develop differently, even if they are getting exactly the same socialization? It's because they differ in their susceptibility, for better and for worse. In fact, I think what we have here is why non-shared environments come out so strongly in behavior genetic work. Because it's not, so much, it's not necessarily the case that the reason these two kids develop differently is because they have different exposures. It's because these two kids, even when they have the same exposure, are differentially affected by it. And to me, that makes lots of sense, because even though I think it's best if my kids become cooperative, nice, sharing, and all those good things that we middle class affluent families want our kids to be, if tomorrow turns out to be you know, Trumpian to extreme, that might be a fool's errand. Now, what's also interesting I like about this study is, and this is something I probably should have emphasized and didn't, which is, at some point, everybody falls off the cliff when things are bad. That is to say, think of it this way. You have a bunch of people, they jump out of the second story window. Some will walk, some will twist an ankle, some will break a leg, some will break their back. Out of the 14th floor window, everybody's dead. 
So it's not like everybody, it's not like there are going to be some people who are immune to the worst that life has to offer. At some point, everybody's going to succumb. That wasn't clear, I think, in the earlier graphs. It becomes clear really here that by the time household income is zero, everybody's paying a price for it, even if it's not the same degree. All right, but everything I've given you so far and showed you so far is observational data. And we know that observational data, lots of other stuff could be going on. In all this observational data, people have checked for gene environment correlation to make sure it's not operative. But that's not really a good check. Why? Because all they're looking to see is, did this exposure relate to this particular candidate gene? Well, there are a lot of other candidate genes out there that you haven't considered. So even when we don't get a gene environment correlation, and therefore we can put more confidence in the G by E, it doesn't mean that there aren't other gene environment correlations running around that we haven't entertained. An experiment overcomes that. Because what we're doing here is we're randomly assigning people to a treatment condition or to a control condition. Um, so environment is randomized. And now the hypothesis is that the very things that we've thought about as risk factors, negative emotionality, physiological reactivity, DRD47 repeat, short alleles, um, metalleles, and BDNF, if you have them, you should disproportionately benefit from intervention. That's the hypothesis drawn from everything we've seen. Now, the interesting thing is that while the field of medicine and psychiatry and psychology and education has spent decades studying who succumbs to adversity with a focus on organismic individual characteristics, your temperament, your physiology, your genetics, when it comes to looking at the heterogeneity of intervention effects, the only place we seem to go to is fidelity of treatment. How well was the intervention administered? And maybe that's why some kids benefit and some kids don't. For whatever reason, when it comes to looking at variation in, 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 in beneficial treatments, we don't entertain the possibility that kids could vary in their susceptibility. Why do we do that automatically when it comes to looking at the effects of adversity? It's like, why isn't, why don't we have a balanced equation here? OK, so I'm going to go through every set of observationally identified plasticity markers, negative emotionality, physiological reactivity, highly sensitive, I'm going to skip that, DRD4, 5-HTTLPR, BDNF, and now multiple genes, and see, do these help us distinguish those who are more and less likely to benefit from a diverse set of interventions? Well, here's a lovely intervention that Jude Cassidy did to examine whether or not an intervention called the circle of security designed to enhance maternal sensitivity and thereby infant attachment security did so and differentially as a function of kids' temperament. And lo and behold, what does she find? That for those kids who are not particularly irritable, there's no difference in the probability of ending up secure in the control group and the intervention group. But if the infant was highly irritable as a newborn, the intervention increased security. If the infant was in the control group, it ended up with less secure. In other words, this intervention succeeded in promoting security but only for the highly negative infants. Perfectly consistent with what we saw before. And in fact, this analysis was done based upon what we saw before, because it was the derived hypothesis when you conducted an experiment. Here we see a similar thing. Now we're looking at an intervention for children with disruptive behavior. And now we're looking at a physiological reactivity, cortisol stress reactivity. We have kids who are highly reactive and kids who are not very reactive. For the kids who are not very reactive, there's no pre-post difference in their overt aggression or their oppositional behavior. But for the kids who are highly reactive, there's a significant reduction. Did this treatment work in reducing aggressive behavior and oppositional behavior? Yes, for some, but not for others. For those who carried what one, some people had thought of as a risk condition, highly physiologically reactive. It's not a risk condition. It looks like it's an opportunity condition. Here we see a brand new piece of work published last year, another attempt to experimentally enhance maternal sensitivity via home visiting. Now we're in the South African highly deprived, um, they don't call them barriers. What do they call them? Um, it's where you know um, black Africans during apartheid were shuttled. These are very deprived environments. And 
So here we're looking at the effect of attachment security of an attempt to enhance maternal sensitivity in the service of attachment security. Lo and behold, what do we see? For the babies who had too long alleles in the serotonin transporter, control and intervention group has no effect. But if you had a short allele, the intervention to foster your mother's sensitivity promoted attachment security. And if you're in the control group, it didn't. In fact, this group and these two groups don't differ from each other. It's only this group. In other words, this intervention to promote maternal sensitivity had the theoretical consequence that was anticipated, the promotion of infant attachment security, but only for a subset of infants, namely those who carried short alleles. Here we're looking at an intervention effect on externalizing behavior among those Romanian institutionalized children. Some of those Romanian children who were institutionalized had care as usual. Others were adopted into foster care and the foster care parents were trained by the, inter by the experimenters to provide good quality care. So the question is, did foster care benefit the kids in terms of these institutionalized kids in terms of their externalizing behavior? Lo and behold, it did. Look what happened. For those who were carrying too short alleles in the care as usual group, they, that is, they stay in the institution, they have the most external behavior problems. For those who were in the intervention group, they had the least behavior problems for better and for worse. The intervention was very effective, but, not, but only for the kids who had short alleles. For the other kids, these groups are not different. Here we see the same study, but with repeated measures, looking at perhaps the behavioral signature of institutional rearing, which has been recognized since the 1940s which is indiscriminate friendliness. Kids who grew up in, di in, in, in seriously depriving institutions in Romania and elsewhere have been found to be overly friendly, to f be ready to approach almost any adult indiscriminately. Makes a certain amount of adaptive sense. If nobody's caring for you, try anybody. And if you can get them to care for you, better yet. So what we have here is a repeated measurement of that phenotype at baseline, 30 months after intervention, 42 months after intervention, 54 months of intervention. Some of them were in the care as usual group with no plasticity alleles. We're looking at zero or two, 5-HT and BDNF. Some of them were in the care as usual group, had two plasticity alleles. The, the um, foster care group, none. The foster care group, two. Basically, before, there's no difference. But look what happens by the time you get to 54 months. Who's got the most indiscriminate friendliness? The kids who were in the care as usual group and who had short alleles and met alleles. The same genotype, if they're in the intervention group, have the least indiscriminate friendliness. This is a huge difference. They've gone up, they've gone down, and the blue and the yellow have basically stayed more or less the same. In other words, the intervention was powerful in reducing indiscriminate friendliness, but only for some who had opportunity alleles, which is short alleles on the serotonin transporter and met alleles on BDNF. This is a different intervention. Now we're looking at the DRD4, 4 to 7 as the moderator. This is looking at externalizing behavior development from screening to pretest to post-test to follow-up as a function of video feedback, parenting intervention to promote more skilled, positive, responsive, rewarding parenting and less punishing parenting. You see the same thing. Who started out with the most problems? The kids who had the intervention and had seven repeat. But they're like the kids, these, th there's no difference here. But what happens? Who ends up with the least problems? The ones in the intervention group who had the seven repeats. The ones who were in the intervention group but didn't have the seven repeats, here they are with the other guys. The intervention didn't affect them. Now, the interesting thing about this study is, like several of the studies I pointed out, this is a study that's looking at a child outcome, child behavior problems, externalizing problems, but via a parenting intervention. The parenting, the intervention was designed to promote more skilled parenting. Well, within that, skilled parenting within that treated group of parents, you might expect that some of those parents that intervention worked for, they became more skilled. And some of those parents in the intervention group didn't benefit them the most. Well, that would lead to the expectation, I would think, as it did to the authors, that where you're really going to see a difference is not just if you were in the experimental group and had the seven repeat, 
But if you had the experimental repeat, if you were in the seven repeat in the experimental group and your parent changed a lot versus a little. And that's exactly what they found. Because so here are the seven repeats who are in the experimental group whose parents changed a great deal. These also were their, if you would, treatment twins in the experimental group, genetic twins, seven repeats in the DRD4, but their parents didn't change much in their skill, in their care. So really, the effect here is mixing together those in the experimental treatment group who responded to the parenting intervention and the parents who didn't. And it's only when the parents really responded to the parenting intervention that you get the effect. This is critically important because what it raises the possibility is that in most intervention evaluations, it may be a small set of cases who are carrying the mean intervention effect. And if we don't look at the heterogeneity in the treated group, we won't see that. We'll just say, oh, on average they're better. That glibly translate all too often into this intervention works for everybody. When? It doesn't work for everybody. It works for more. Now, what it also begs the question is, why did some of these parents in the experimental group who received the parent education, why did they prove responsive and the other parents didn't? Is it because they're short allele carriers in the serotonin transporter or they're seven repeat carriers in the DRP4? We don't know because they didn't genotype the parents. But my hypothesis is when parenting interventions affect kids, it's most likely because you have a susceptible parent coupled with a susceptible child. And that small group of, that small group of dyads may be pushing the whole mean up or down, depending on what the outcome is, um, and are responsible for the overall treatment effect. That it's not everybody in the treated group is benefiting. It's that benefit is being disproportionately weighted by a subset of highly susceptible or malleable adults and children. And here is a final example, I think, is we're looking at the effects of meditation on perceived stress that's moderated by BDNF. And lo and behold, what happens? If you're homozygous for the metal deal, you have the most stress response if you're in the control group, but you have the least stress response if you're in the meditation group. And in fact, you've got a dose response. One metal deal has the has the least stress response, two metal deals have the least stress response, one metal deal has more, no metal deals has more. And so clearly you see a dose response relationship in terms of degree of plasticity. I'm sorry. My last slide, this is a piece of work that I did in collaboration with some Dutch colleagues, which is a mimicry of what the other Dutch parent study done that I just talked about of parent education. The difference is that was a videotaped feedback intervention for very young children. This is for older kids. These are boys who are high in externalizing problems. And this intervention is a widely used one disseminated around the world called the Incredible Years. Well, I was very interested in the Incredible Years is one of these certified programs because it's shown to be effective. But is that because everybody's being affected or is that because only some are being affected and carrying and, and are responsible for the treatment? And here what we see, and, and this is a biologically informed attempt to get all dopamine genes here. And what you see is if you look at the problem behavior intensity scale, that the solid black line is guess who? It's the intervention group that got incredible years and had the most plasticity alleles. They changed the most. No difference here, but by follow-up, a significant difference. And in fact, when we did the same follow-up to this study that the previous study I talked about did and distinguished within this group the parents who changed a lot in their behavior and the parents who didn't, we get the same finding. That it's a kid with plasticity alleles whose parents were in the treatment group and who changed a lot in their parenting, who was carrying the overall treatment effect. There is an overall treatment effect, but it's not equally distributed or randomly distributed. It's being affected by the susceptibility, the individuals who are most susceptible. All right, that's all the data I'm going to show you. It's a simple theme, quite frankly. But it raises some interesting questions. One is, are the same susceptible individuals being detected using different foci for the plasticity alleles? Temperament, because some of us study temperament. Physiology, because some of us study physiology. And genetics, because some of us study genetics. Well, there's reason to believe that that might be so. Why? 
because there's some evidence that short allele carriers are more physiologically reactive. There's some evidence that more physiologically reactive kids have more negative emotionality. And there's also some evidence that short allele carriers and seven repeat DRD babies are more negatively emotional. So this may be a classic case of that elephant where some of us are holding onto the tail. It's genetics. Other people are holding onto the trunk. It's temperament. Other people are holding on to the legs. That's physiology, and therefore we think that's what's important. What's important is that we've got the elephant. One of the things that fascinates me is we seem to lack a language for upsized plasticity. I've given a talk like this around the world, <laughs> in, in Japan, in, in China, in Italy, in Spain, in Switzerland, in Norway, in Sweden, in England, in Portugal, in, you know, in Mexico. And I asked the same question, which is, if we want to, we have a word in our vernacular for individuals who are disproportionately likely to succumb to adverse adversity. They're vulnerable. What word do you use to characterize individuals who are disproportionately likely to benefit from support and enrichment? I have not found a language around the world, and I asked this to people, where there's a word for that in the vernacular, an obvious word. And I say to people, think about it, email me, come up with a word. Nobody has. You know, I come up with one word, lucky, if you're disproportionately likely to benefit from good things. But is that the reason why we haven't seen differential susceptibility and we've only been stuck in a diathesis stress world? Because we have a word for vulnerability, but we don't have a world a word for upside differential plasticity and likelihood to benefit. Um, and now we're back to the old Warfian hypothesis, and I don't even know what the status of that is in psychology and linguistics anymore. And that hypothesis was that if you don't have the word, you don't have the concept. Well, we clearly don't have the word, and we haven't had the concept. Because as I've already said, when it comes to looking at variation in who likely to benefit from intervention, we don't go to organismic characteristics for the most part. We go to number of sessions attended, training of interventionists, fidelity of program. Yet, to repeat, when we want to understand why some people succumb to adversity and other people don't, we go right to organismic characteristics, whether it's temperament, physiology, or genetics. Kind of strange. In fact, I will say this to you. What I'm offering is a strikingly simple idea that there are individual differences in developmental plasticity, which comes down to, to a certain extent, that for some of us, nature may matter more than nurture. And for others of us, nurture may matter more than nature. And that is a very kind of, in some ways, simple and summarizing solution to the nature-nurture controversy. It's not nature or nurture. And it's not just glibly, oh, it's the interaction. It's that some of us have been born or made to be responsive to our environments. Because sometimes in the past, and therefore presumably in the future, that pays off. And some of us have been designed to be more fixed strategist, who just go left or right or up the middle almost no matter what. Because that has paid off in the past. And we've inherited the genes to do that. But this is, I think, a, a critical issue, which is I've been talking mostly about people being more or less developmentally malleable, developmentally plastic or environmentally susceptible to influence. And as I already pointed out, that, could, that shouldn't be meaning yes or no, that you're all malleable or you're not at all, because it looks like there's a gradient of malleability, at least when we look at genetic, multiple genetic variants polygenically. But now we come to a more complex question, which is, is this plasticity domain general across everything, or is it domain specific? Now, I, I think of myself. I think you could have given me all the best musical education in the world, and it wouldn't have made a bad, damn bit of difference. But apparently, giving me a developmental psychological education has made a big difference, or so it seems. So in that sense, I was susceptible to some things and not to other things. And is that really what we need to think about? And so it's adding an order of complexity to everything I've told you. Which, and, and then it becomes, what are the dimensions or the domains? Is it what the stimuli are, what the nature of the information is? And so do we have a, essentially a bell curve of plasticity, where at the extremes you have people who are not responsive to anything? 
the, the, the prototypical fixed strategist. I am the way I am almost no matter what. And then we have the prototypical chameleon. I am affected by my exposures almost no matter what they are. And then in between, we have people who are to a degree malleable and to a deg or to a degree not malleable. And are they malleable along different channels? I don't think we're there yet. I think that's where we have to get to. Because at some level, that seems to make the most intuitive sense. Uh, but it complicates matters immensely. And now, I'll come back to the issue of is plasticity born or made? And as I said earlier, I started with the implicit assumption, because I didn't really think it through, that it was born. Because from an evolutionary standpoint, it made sense that nature would hedge its bets. Boyce and Ellis started with the assumption that it was made. That experience, especially very good experience, they said, and very bad experiences, induced high levels of physiological reactivity and thereby made organisms environmentally sensitive. These aren't mutually exclusive alternatives. We can have plasticity born and plasticity made. In fact, I'll leave you with the most recent and exciting work we've been doing, which is that, put it this way, we've already seen that at least two phenotypes are related to being more plastic for better and for worse. Negative emotionality as an infant and physiological reactivity as a young child high physiological activity. Well, it turns out, interestingly, both those phenotypes are related to being subject to prenatal adversity, prenatal stress, highly anxious mothers, highly depressed mothers, lots of negative life events. Well, if you put these ideas together, prenatal adversity induces, apparently, negative emotionality and physiological reactivity. Physiological reactivity and negative emotionality look like they have plasticity factors. That inferentially suggests that what prenatal adversity is doing is inducing postnatal plasticity via negative emotionality and physiological reactivity. Well, that's an idea. It's plausible. Well, my graduate student came up to me one day and said, Jay, how about if we test that with an animal model? And I said, sounds like a good idea, but you know, I'm not an animal person. She says, oh, but there's a woman named Karen Bales over in psychology, and I think, how about if I talk to her about this idea? I said to her, Sarah, go ahead and talk to her. My guess is, you know, this isn't her shtick. She's probably not going to be open to it. Her lab and her animals are probably overcommitted, et cetera. But I said, go try it. Sarah went over and talked to her. Karen was open to running an experiment. I said to my student, I said, you know, you have to understand this is part of your dissertation. This is a very high risk enterprise. This could all be a big dry hole. If I don't tell you that, I'm not doing my job. But I'm not going to discourage you. I just need to inform you. It's really up to you. Do you want to take this intellectual risk? And she said she did. So what did she do? She went to the literature and found what are normative rodent stressors prenatally. And she implemented them. It had to do in the last week of pregnancy, exposing the pregnant animal to a aggressive conspecific behind a glass. And that was well known to be a stressor for these animals. Then those, and so that was randomized. You get the stressor or you don't. Then those babies were then cross-fostered, adopted, so to speak, by High-skilled mothers and low-skilled mothers, i.e., high-licking and grooming and low-licking grooming. We're all familiar with that. And the hypothesis was simply that those voles who were prenatally stressed would be maximally different as a function of their postnatal rearing environment. Those voles who were not prenatally stressed would not be different and would fall in between the other two, just as we've seen before. That's exactly what she found. The paper's in press. It's online, actually, in psychological science. That we have evidence that prenatal adversity is promoting postnatal plasticity. Now, I had a colleague say to me, Jay, that's all well and good, but what's your theoretical reason for why that would be? I said, you know, I don't really have one. This was an empirical inference. This was, we got these findings, we got those findings, and put them together, they lead here. Um, but I talked to my son, Daniel, and he had a very interesting idea that I didn't know of. And he said, well, you know, there's plenty of evidence across species that stress decanalizes development. It disrupts normative developmental processes, or it can. 
But most of the time, that leads to death, especially prenatally. Well, what about the possibility that we have evolved not to succumb to that decanalization because it doesn't go all the way? But it's almost like under adversity, what the fetus has evolved to do is to say, um, I can't trust the tantalized development I'm supposed to have because it may not fit the world out there. So let me take my instructions from what's out there. In other words, decanalization turns the fixed strategist into a plastic strategist. That's the hypothesis. Now, what my graduate student, who is now my postdoc, Sarah Hartman, is going to do, the next step is to take these voles, prenatally stress them, and when they're born, sacrifice them, take out their brains, slice their brains, and begin to look where are the brain differences, or, or there are specific places, plasticity-wise, that you might expect brain differences in stressed and non-stressed fetuses. Are they there? Thank you. Hi, this is a very inspiring talk. I must say I've been having this idea flowing, but I, I'm glad you, you, you guys have formalized it. Uh, two quick questions. First, how many people, like in humankind, would you consider to be plastic, so to say? Like the proportions? Yeah, yeah. I guess it, it, it depends on the minor li the frequency of the genes you're talking about. And it's like Okay. Right, the uh, mic only goes to the camera, so it doesn't go to the audience. Right. Yeah. yeah. But you, you heard me, I guess. Yes, okay. The let me take the first question first. Yes. Okay. The first question is, what percentage of individuals are plastic? Well, I get that question a lot. And I think the first answer is, should we presume, well, well the first answer is, it looked like it's the minority, not the majority, because all the variants, be it DRD4, 7 repeat, or short alleles in the serotonin transport, whatever it is, they're minor variants. So especially when you start putting together multiple genes, there are going to be fewer and fewer people with more and more plasticity alleles, apparently. Um, so it looks like they're the few, not the many. Um, and maybe that makes sense. Maybe we can't all be open and susceptible. Um, we'd have too many leaders and not enough, too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Um, but then let me challenge you and say this is, why should we presume that's exactly the same in every population? And think about it this way. When would it make sense for plasticity to evolve? If within a people over a historical period of time, there's no relationship between the present and the future, within or between generations, then it wouldn't make sense to evolve an internal guidance system based on incoming cues, because it wouldn't have any accurate forecast. By the same token, if today was a perfect or really, really strong predictor of tomorrow, why would I build in plasticity? I just, the, the genetic variation would just go to fixation, and we'd all be designed to fit that environment, you know, which is why all fish have gills, because variation in breathing doesn't get the job done. It's really only when there's some degree, I don't know how much, degree of relationship between present and future that it makes sense to develop a capacity to program development based on the present in the service of the future, it seems to me. So that says to me that in different populations that have a different exposures to predictable environments, we should see different rates of plasticity. So in environments in which they were mostly today and tomorrow and the next day were stochastic, we don't select for plasticity. Environments where there's a probabilistic relationship between what today is tells you about tomorrow, we should have more plasticity. In environments in which that relationship between the world today and the world tomorrow is so strong, we also shouldn't have plasticity. So in that sense, I would love to see a demographer or a geneticist come along and say, you know, we know populations and we know something about their histories of their environments over long stretches of time. Would we find different rates of short alleles or seven repeats in the DRD4 or other plasticity factors? And the follow-up question would be that <coughs> all your data is about children being plas having plasticity or not, but 
Does this, do these traits also fall up to adult life? Okay, remember they weren't, I purposely highlighted, um, maybe you took my recommendation and took a little nap. Um, they, 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 remember we had some um, marital behavior being affected and we had some parenting be affected, so those are adults. But one of the most interesting studies that's been done was done with caregivers of Alzheimer's patients. That is, you were the spouse of an Alzheimer's patient or you weren't a spouse of an Alzheimer's patient. And what, we found, what was found was short allele carriers who had an Alzheimer's patient as a spouse were the most depressed and had the worst sleep. Those with the same short alleles who didn't have an Alzheimer's pa spouse had the least depression and the most sleep. And these were people who were like 60 to 80 years of age taking care of their demented um, spouses. So, so we see with parents of infants, we see with marriages, and now we see with caregivers. In adulthood, we get the same kind of differential susceptibility to these environmental exposures. So suggest this isn't only a developmental phenomenon. <coughs> oh, up here. Um, thank you for a very beautiful talk. Uh, although, uh, to show diversity in disciplines, while you found the talk inspiring, I found it a bit depressing. <laughs> because uh, I work with Lorette to look at how do we model interventions, uh, public health interventions in a population? And this would seem to raise lots of questions about how one designs an intervention. I mean, uh, I do computational modeling, so immediately my mind drifts to what's the asymptote of this? Do I, does this seem to imply that we should do genetic uh, sequencing in order to understand whether our intervention will work and then segregate those children that it will work in? I mean, there seems to be some very huge ethical considerations yep. here because it's um, if I'm doing this intervention and it's not going to work on 90% of the people, why bother doing it? So right. I, I mean, have you? I, I'm. You know what? I realize I left out, and I'm glad I did. Implications for intervention. <laughs> what a nice segue. We, 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 right. Thank you. Um, he's a plant. Um, what we have here is the issue of efficacy and equity. When I when I get when I started giving a talk like this when I worked in London. You know, the UK is a socialist country. People were aghast at the implications of this. And I remember talking to James Heckman, the Nobel laureate in economics, who's very interested in early intervention. And I explained to James how the English responded to this, the, these kind of findings and aghast at the notion that you might target, God forbid, those most likely to benefit and serve them first or only because they were so obsessed with equity. And James, being the economist that he is, kind of looked at me and like kind of, what are they smoking? What are they drinking? You know, it just, it was obvious that, you know, if that's the nature of the beast, that's the nature of the beast. But I mean, let, let me say a couple of things here. I don't see, and, and the thing about my English colleagues and their socialist orientation is they think they've got the moral high ground. Where is the moral high ground in taxing everybody to provide services to people that don't work? Um, and in fact, so I come back and, and wonder about a couple of things. Most importantly, and, and I wrote an editorial for the, an op-ed for the New York Times a couple of years ago in which I made this point, although people didn't get it, um, which is that there are two reasons why these interventions aren't working for maybe a lot of people. One is because those people are not malleable, end of story. The other possibility is they're malleable, they're just not malleable to what we're dishing out. And so the moral of the story seems to me that the extent we have more and more evidence of this, to this extent, and we can get to the point where we can reliably say, we don't have an abundance of resources, we're going to triage and we're going to go for those people <coughs> who are most likely to benefit and serve them first, but we're going to keep seeing if we can develop alternatives for the people who are not responsive. Now, some of those people who are not responsive, my guess is, are not going to be responsive to a whole lot. But some of them might be responsive to something else. But I think sticking our head in the ground and saying, I don't like the implication of this, which is what so many people do. It, it's kind of like, um, you know, I don't want to learn about physics, so I'm going to climb up onto that mountain, and I'm going to strap feathers onto my arms, and I'm going to jump off and try to fly. Whereas if you came to grips with physics, you'd develop propulsion and lift because you'd have engineering and you'd have aerodynamics. So, and, and, and just as importantly, 
It may be, for example, let's say these people are not responsive currently. Um, but we, saw, we heard a lovely piece of work today where somebody presented a virus to target a gene, if I recall correctly, in mice, and all of a sudden that opened the door that wasn't open before. Um, so let's say these effects might be, epi let's just take a popular idea, that these differential effects are epigenetically mediated. That the reason the intervention works for some but not for others is because for some the epigenome is responsive and for others it's not. Might we develop pharmacological drugs to open that epigenome and let it be environmentally induced? Seems plausible. But having said that, we should be really concerned about that idea. Because the minute I can make everybody susceptible, I have an awful lot of control and power. You know, stop and ask yourself, who became a Nazi and who didn't? Maybe people who didn't were not susceptible. Maybe if I can make everybody susceptible, we'd have more Nazis, more Trump voters. <laughs> yeah. Um, like oh. Thanks very much for the, for the talk and for a whole body of work that uh, I cite frequently. I study prenatal and maternal stress. Okay. And I love, in, I love interactions. And so I spend my life looking at, at graphs like, like you've shown. And depending on what the, what the results tell me, I either invoke vulnerability stress because I don't have the upside, the, the, the upside uh, or I invoke uh, differential susceptibility. Is it, can they both be true in different situations uh, or uh, any time I'm invoking vulnerability stress, it's just because I'm not going into the positive? I, I, I mean, I think the latter point is possible, but I wouldn't bet on it. That is, I think there are probably real death as a stress processes and there are real differential susceptibility processes. And my student, Michael Pluis, is invested in what he co we call um, vantage sensitivity processes where you're just susceptible on the upside but not on the downside. I think that variation is going to exist. Okay. I think probably. One of the things we haven't talked about <coughs> is the effect of adversity on how fast you develop, both psychologically and biologically. It sort of speeds things up. It just makes me think that if you have a bunch of kids at the same age, and some have had adversity and some haven't, they may be at the same chronological age, but at a very different stage of their development. And I'm just wondering if you've thought at all about that and how that could... Well, I don't know if you know my... You know, my first foray into thinking evolutionarily led to the prediction that adversity would accelerate the timing of puberty. Yeah, yeah. And there's exactly. evidence to that effect. There's now evidence that the estrogen receptor gene moderates that. That is to say that some girls look like they're susceptible to that effect, that accelerating effect, and some girls are not. Steve Manick at Pittsburgh was the first to show this, and then we replicated his retrospective, his, his adult findings with, the, with our child development data prospectively. So yeah, I think that's what's going on here, quite frankly. I mean, I don't think development is about health, wealth, and happiness. I think development is about reproductive fitness. Right. And so this plasticity is about the likelihood of is how to get genes out there in the next generation. Health, wealth, health, wealth and happiness may be mediators of that or conditions that you know, condition that. Um, but yes, this is, but rate of development ought to be very much the target here. And there is some evidence both at the temperamental level, the physiological level, and the genetic level that we get variability we get, we get systematic differential susceptibility like variation in how adversity affects timing of puberty in girls. Just and, and I had one more question, uh, having the microphone. Um, the stability of the outcome, is there any difference there? So in other words, is it possible that those you know, highly temperamental kids, the high risk ones, the more plastic ones, can look good for a while, but then you keep following them. Oh, they don't look so good anymore. Well, so, I, do they hold on to that good outcome yeah, as long well, as well, the? Well, and stable? that raises the question: sort of, does the, do they remain open plastic, plasticity-wise? Yeah, like, yeah. what happens if you're negatively emotional, you have the seven repeat, or you have the short allele, and you're fortunate enough to have a really good parent, and so you're well adjusted, you're self-controlled, you're well regulated, but then you go into yeah a bad school, a bad peer group, a bad neighborhood, are you still susceptible? I, I don't think we know that yet. And I, and I come back to, and I mentioned this earlier in the day, Wilhelm Frankenhus's notion of 
how reliable the environmental cues, on, cues are. Because what he's arguing is, if you get consistently reliable environmental cues and you're plastic, then you should commit to that <coughs> lesson in life. And so, therefore, you should stay stable, according to his model. In contrast, if you're getting unreliable cues, your caregivers are sensitive some of the time and not sensitive other the time, so you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, you should keep your program open and wait for consolidation of exposure before you commit to a developmental trajectory. Um, so I think, in answer to your question, I think one of the things to look at is how stable the environment is. Not just, you know, not just how stable the outcome is. Um, but I ultimately think that, and I, and I said this earlier in the day, that um, I think there are people who will be changeable in aging years, people who will be changeable and not in midlife, so people who will be changeable and not in adolescence, and people who will be changeable and not in childhood. Why? Because in the past, both of those, all those strategies have paid off. So I think there will be people who will be open all across life. Other people will just be open early and then fixed. Other people will be open early and later. I mean, I think we're going to, I think, yeah, that we're going to have a mosaic of that kind of variability, which we're only, you know, that's what we're picking up here from, you know, and, and making it look like it's over at some point, when for many it's over, and for others it stays open. So, question. I think the brain is plastic. Every brain is plastic. It, and the brain is nothing else than plastic, right? It's the organ that changes in response to experience. You're referring, I think, to affective plasticity, which may be different. But cognitively, we remain plastic. We can remember new things. We can learn new things forever. Well, speak for right. yourself. Well, <laughs> I, well, but there's variation. I'm learning from your talk. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, right, right, right. You know. and, and I've learned from the work of people like you. But the point is, there's still variation in that plasticity. Sure. Um, and so th it's really that variation that I'm calling attention to. Uh, you know, there, I, may, I want to make two fundamental points. Is that plasticity may be a phenotype that we should expect individual differences in. And in so doing, it should turn out, according to these data, that the people who are most vulnerable on the downside are most, have the most opportunity on the upside. And I think both of those ideas, at least from a developmental human development perspective are, are rarely new, are, are actually new ideas because we presumed, everybody's, we presumed everybody's plastic without considering individual differences. But actually my main point question to you is, you could, you could say that the stress diathesis and the, and the plasticity models are really not in opposition. No. Because it may be that most of the action is on the negative side, right? Except Goodness. for that prenatal smoking. Sure, there yeah. are examples, but yeah. in most right. of your graphs, most of the differences yeah. are, and goodness might have a ceiling effect, right? If you're a kid, if you have loving parents, you're educated, you're fed, you're vaccinated, you can't get better than that. But on the negative side, there are probably different levels of abuse yeah. and negativity, and so. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree. Uh, the only point I would make is maybe we see more downside variation because we've spent so much more time studying adversity than opportunity. But, but yes, I, I think in principle, it's, it's an empirical question. I, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Okay, just have a question more, or ask you to comment a little bit more about the co-occurrence. So you mentioned, I think, more in, in passing about the missed opportunity that for genotyping the parents as well, to right. see the degree to which if, if, the, you know, if the parents perhaps are plastic and the children are plastic, what might be the effect of that? And I, I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more theoretically about whether you might expect some amplification, whether there'd be some well, kind of substitution of the, f I mean, well, just I, I mean, yeah. I just have a, would have, have a very simple model, which is um, if you don't, at least from an intervention standpoint, if the parent's not susceptible, then how can the kid be affected through a parenting intervention? If, if, if the parent is susceptible, but the kid's not, well, then why do you expect the change in the parent will affect the kid? So it's when both the parent and the kid are highly susceptible that you're going to see maximal benefit. And that's what I think the two parenting intervention studies that have bothered to look at this have both shown, which is that the treatment group, that's pla when the kids are plastic and they're in the treatment group, they benefit the most. But within that treated group of plastic <laughs> kids, it's the ones whose parents change the most 
who are the ones who change the most. So I think it's the coupling, and, and, and this is why I said what I said, which is I wonder in how many of these parenting interventions um, or in interventions to promote good quality childcare or interventions to enhance teacher education, um, it's when both the deliverer of experience, the teacher, the caregiver, the parent, and the recipient of that experience are both maximally susceptible that you're going to see the biggest effect. And that effect may be big enough to carry the whole group along, even though it's, even if it's a min minority of individuals. Um, and that becomes, you know, what do you do with that? What if, what, what if when all these certified intervention programs, what we discover is, yeah, their means better, their, the mean scores are better, and we get a nice intervention effect, but it's actually a minority that's carrying that. Um, I think that, you know, changes the way we look at these treatments. Because all of a sudden, we have a treatment by organism interaction. You have one last question. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's really 750. That's really the last one. No one else. Well, actually, I have two. Uh, it's one. <laughs> <laughs> a and B. Well, uh, it's a two-pronged question, but okay. it's... Uh, Go for it. At Georgetown University, my recent research was with uh, Dr. Robert Clark and... Uh, um, and Dr. Clark, you know, husband and wife, they both run labs at Georgetown University, Lombardi Cancer, okay. Co Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Research Institute okay. at, in Washington, D.C., okay. just before I moved over here to, to uh, Montreal. So the, the, uh, the research that we co they're conducting uh, is basically uh, autophagy, the, uh, the the impact of isolation uh, on autophagy with regard to women. Uh, not, I don't want to say women. It's actually we want to look at. We, we, we hopefully want to apply the research, the research findings for human beings, but okay. it's it's done with uh, animals. Okay. But the looking at uh, autophagy, or rather the impact of isolation on autophagy for in this case we're hoping for human beings. Uh, women who are recovering or who, cancer patients who have breast cancer and their response to uh, tamoxifen. Okay. So, I mean, I, I'm just trying to get you to think of this. So, yeah. the, 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 the researchers, Dr. 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 Clark, is not including mindfulness uh -huh. as a component of the research. Uh -huh. And that's where, when I look at your number four, implications for intervention. Right. So the efficacy for what we're looking at, or rather looking at the hypothesis, is how can you include a component of mindfulness for... Okay, it seems to me, I, I think I understand your question. On the one hand, you know, does this drug treatment depend upon a psychosocial, depend on a psychosocial component too? That seems perfectly reasonable. But you could add to that, even if the drug treatment needs a psychosocial component to really be powerful, it may be more powerful with some people of certain temperament, physiology, or genetics than other people. There may be different susceptibility to that. You know, there's enough variation in how all these medications work um, that there's plenty of room for trying to explain why some are responsive and some aren't. So I think the absence of a psychosocial or the presence of a psychosocial intervention could play a role and could organismic characteristics of the individual could play a role in determining who benefits and who doesn't seem to benefit. Very well said and, and thank you. And then with regard to the same question, the implications for intervention, my, it's actually your presentation is very much in line with the intervention for my dissertation, which was pretty much on mindfulness or rather the effectiveness of mindfulness awareness program for early adolescents in poverty, particularly right. ages 10 to 13. And the population is specifically where uh, young black adolescents, male and female, and Latinos in, from a poor yep. uh, but, but public very school in, in uh, Lancaster, okay. Philadelphia, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Yeah. So I even suggest, sorry to interrupt, to continue at 7.15, maybe okay. continue uh, uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis after? Sure. Okay. So this, the susceptibility, susceptibility effect.
could be there. Yep. Yep. Thank you for this last question, but most importantly, thank you very, very much. Sure. You have been so generous and so insightful uh, for your insights and your lifetime. What is your next, gener next line of work uh, uh, to advance this differential susceptibility? You have the voles, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, looking at prenatal, prenatal adversity effects in different samples and you know, that kind of thing. Thank you so. very much. Thanks to all of you to be here uh, tonight. We have those uh, Brain to Society seminar every two months you or so. You might want to so Google thank you very, the very name much. of a guy. Thank you.